Hello. Uh, hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure for us to have Professor David Coker here, and let me do a little bit of introduction for him. He's actually a physics professor at University College Dublin, and also a chemistry professor at Boston University. Um, he actually did his bachelor's at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, then he did his PhD work at Austria, Australian National in Canberra, and then he went to the States uh, to postdoc uh, at Columbia University. 
Um, I actually met him at Boston University. I was an undergrad uh, chemistry student, and he taught me thermodynamics in very well delivered and very extremely current uh, lectures. Um, uh, what I should also say about him is that uh, he is uh, the director of uh, the Complex Adaptive Systems Laboratory, uh, as well as the director of the, uh, the, C uh, the Irish node of CCAM, uh, which is an ato atomic and molecular calculation center. Okay, so, uh, it's called Atomic Modeling and Simulation Center in, in Dublin. Um, so since he's a, a physics and a chemistry professor, it suits that he's going to today tell us about a biological, uh, biological thing, photosynthesis, but actually the physical basis and computational basis of that. Thank you. Merhaba, uh, everyone. So, <laughs> that's as good as I can do at the moment. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, to be here and to have visited uh, with the physics department uh, during the, the last day. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you also all for coming. This is a, a, a very uh, full room of, of, of hopefully very interested people, so let me see how I can motivate you and excite you about uh, quantum simulation of environmental effects on, on photosynthesis. Okay, so this is a very biological uh, quantum mechanics. We don't usually think about quantum mechanics and biological systems. Uh, I'm going to show you that that's actually uh, not such a, that, that's not a good idea. You actually need to worry about quantum mechanics all the time, okay? And uh, so that's basically my motivation here. Um, and uh, so I'm going to be moving through these things. So uh, uh, my, the talk is actually to study two things, looking at energy transfer, that is how energy moves through biological structures, uh, and when it, as it moves through these biological structures, they are dissipative. They, they basically, the energy gets absorbed and it dissipates as it moves, and you'll see examples of how this works. And as they dissipate energy, they run downhill to special places uh, where all of a sudden that energy is transformed by the separation of charge into a current, okay? So that's basically energy transfer and charge separation. Does this have a laser pointer on it? Do we have a laser pointer? Do you have a laser pointer somewhere? Who can I ask? That's just a remote control. Okay. Um, so this is work that uh, goes on, as uh, Balash uh, indicated, both in Boston and uh, at the University College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, it's funded uh, by uh, both the National Science Foundation and the Science Foundation Ireland, as well as uh, funding also from the EU. Uh, and the various universities involved. These are a wonderful group of postdocs and graduate students. Usually people leave this to the end. I never finish on time, so I always try and put it up at the beginning because it's very important to thank the people who really did the work. Okay? Uh, and uh, so they are Sarah Bonella, Emily Gonko, and Peng Fei Ho, who developed a lot of the algorithms that you'll be seeing the results of. I'm not gonna tell you about too much mathematics. There are about 30 slides in this talk of mathematics, okay? If you want, uh, actually I will flip through them just to entice you to think about mathematics, okay? Uh, and, and equations. Uh, I'm a theoretician, after all. I am doing simulation work and you require a, bl a blueprint on how to do that and that's what mathematics provides us, okay? Uh, uh, you will get to see lots of these things, and I'll flip through them very quickly. I have a colleague, uh, his name is Sean Lukamel. You probably may have, some of you may have heard of him. He is responsible for a lot of nonlinear optical spectroscopy and the theory behind it. Shaw has a wonderful uh, saying that is, uh, well, if a picture is worth a thousand words, an equation is worth a thousand pictures. And so my, the middle of my talk that you're not going to see is probably the equivalent of uh, the Amazon video library several times over as far as uh, video, uh, as far as pictures are concerned. Okay, so we're not going to see all those pictures. Uh, okay, a quick outline 
I'm going to uh, spend a little, uh, little time showing you some experimental results that basically uh, inform us that nature actually uh, has these remarkable structures that c gather solar energy and uh, move it around in materials in uh, very intriguing ways. Uh, so these are called excitonic antenna arrays. These excitons are excited molecules. So excitation is here, and it's communicated in much the same way as your cell phone talks to other cell phones and, and cell phone towers, uh, by dipole radiation to another molecule, to another molecule, to another molecule, and we'll actually see these processes taking place. These processes are fundamentally quantum mechanical in nature. Okay, This is, this is where the quantum mechanics so at the heart of this fundamentally biological process are quantum mechanical energy transport, quantum mechanical energy transfer processes. And uh, that's what these excitonic arrays uh, uh, do. Uh, and what they use it for is actually channeling uh, energy into places where that energy is then transformed into electrons and uh, positive charges. And those are the things that give rise to the current. Well, actually, this is a biological process, so it doesn't do that. Okay? What it does is it converts that energy into chemical energy as a result. Okay? So we use these things in photovoltaics and these sorts of uh, materials. Uh, nature uses it to do chemistry, okay? to provide the driving force for redox reactions. Redox reactions. Uh, so I'll spend a little time telling you about how this energy transport, transport takes place and show you some experiments that actually probe the quantum mechanical nature of this energy transport process. Now, uh, quantum mechanics, as we all know, is tough. It's a, a big challenge. Of course, you have to solve very nasty equations. Okay? That's just to think about things like the states of atoms and molecules, P orbitals, S orbitals. These sorts of things. When you start thinking about quantum mechanics moving, so with time dependence, this becomes very, very difficult to actually think about and to actually understand. There's a beautiful equation, the time dependent Schrodinger equation, written down many, many years ago, that we use to do it, okay? But actually being able to physically do it on a system that looks like some of those things I showed you at the beginning is very, very difficult. So I'm going to actually show you how we do this, okay? That's what the 30 pages of slides in the middle of the talk are about, that you're not going to get to see. Okay, well, we'll flip through very quickly. Um, so that's this third point here, these powerful new open quantum systems. What do I mean by that? Open, an open quantum system is like uh, the room. Okay, the door is open, air flows in and out of the room, uh, exchanging heat in and out of the room. In the same way, these, these quantum mechanical antennae molecules exchange energy with each other, but they also exchange energy with the environment, okay? So that's that dissipative, for, uh, dissipative quantum mechanical dynamics that really is at the heart of what we have to build in order to study the systems. We've spent several years developing algorithms and methods based on fundamental quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. This is bringing the two together so that we can do this, okay? And I'll show you some results of, of these sorts of, sorts of things. Um, the talk will actually have a large part of it actually exploring various manifestations of the quantum mechanics in real systems, real biological systems. So for the biologists amongst us, uh, this is actually this is uh, a particular uh, antenna, piece of an antenna from a piece of bacteria. Okay? Uh, this thing down here, PC645, is actually the bulk of what makes our oceans green. It's an algae. It's a, it's a way uh, that the algae actually uh, photosynthesize, uh, or a, a part of their harvesting uh, components. Uh, and what I'll do at the end, in fact, I'll do it at the beginning and then at the end, okay, is I'll show you some materials that are being made. We have collaborators, the ones that I'll show you at the moment. These are collaborators in uh, Oxford University in England who are actually making polymeric <coughs> materials that behave very much like the biological materials and uh, carbon nanotubes that behave very much like the electron hole separation uh, components, the reaction centers that break the uh, excitation apart. Uh, and uh, so these are uh, biomimetic, uh, using the biology to help us design and understand how to, how to make these materials more efficient uh, and, uh, and these sorts of things. Okay, so at that point, I'm going to switch to um, a 
different type of presentation because I have graduate students that don't have maths. And so they do things in PowerPoint. And um, that's just why. So this is the basic cartoon for what we're talking about here. Okay? I've got a bunch of electrons sitting on uh, uh, atoms. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is a valence band, that's a conduction band. This is a, a pink uh, arrow of light coming in. Photo exciting this molecule in the sample. This molecule now has produced an electron and a hole. That electron is now moving in, a, in the uh, conduction band. And this, pro this quantity is what we're going to call the exciton. And that is the formation of an excited molecule within our sample. Now, what do these molecules look like? We're going to see some more examples of them in a second. This is our electron hole pair, uh, is an exciton. If they move around in a correlated way, this is energy transfer. Okay? And uh, so here, for example, is uh, our first, this is a very simple, this is the hydrogen atom of these energy transfer networks. This is called the fenner matthews olsen complex. It's from a bacteria, the purple sulfur bacteria. Uh, you'll see more of it later. There's a lot of uh, slides of it uh, that show it in better detail. But here, this particular uh, chlorophyll molecule, these things here are the heavy groups of chlorophyll molecules. Uh, this particular chlorophyll molecule has been excited. So it's got an electron in a hole sitting on the one atom, okay? Uh, or on the one molecule. The, that that uh, state is delocalized over that particular thing, but it doesn't spread out uh, to these other uh, guys. What you're actually looking at in the top corner there is a simulation using the algorithms that I outlined, uh, that I mentioned, okay, of how the energy moves from state one to state two to state three to state four. There are all the different uh, colored lines here, okay, we'll see where this comes from later. Uh, and you see some interesting behavior. So as time goes on, the, excita the exciton starts to live in not one but two places. Okay, live in uh, on this molecule here and on that molecule there. There it is. It's starting to get uh, a mixture of two, exit, uh, two uh, excitations on two different molecules. Okay, and that's where uh, the red and the green curve are uh, are more or less in the same place. Uh, over here, it's starting to look. Uh, uh, you're starting to see molecule number three. That's the blue curve here. You got that uh, that's the blue curve going there. And so what's happening here is the energy is being transferred between these two. There's evidence of what we call coherent beating. Okay, that's what those little wiggles in the populations are. That's, co that's quantum coherence actually taking place there. And as that uh, dies away, you're starting to see the population finally move over to this molecule here. So that's a cartoon of what the energy transfer process that we're trying to model actually looks like. Uh, and the, uh, these are the, uh, what I'm going to call the chromophores. They're the colored molecules. They are the guys that can absorb the light and transfer the light from one place to another place. As you can see, there's a cartoon in the top left-hand corner here uh, of what this thing really looks like. There's a big mess of protein around it. Okay? This is a bath. This is an environment. This is the, outside the, the air supply outside the door. This is where the energy is going to go. Okay, or how it's or the place where it's going to be dissipated to. Okay? So it's protein okay, uh, in these types of materials. Uh, incidentally, let me just give you a, uh, for the biologists amongst us, uh, this thing here is actually uh, a, uh, a cartoon of what this uh, molecule actually does. Okay? This molecule is a piece of exotonic wire. Okay? Uh, energy gets absorbed in that little uh, uh, sphere that's labeled uh, chlorosome antenna, okay? That's where the, energy, the light energy gets absorbed. It wanders around through a very dense packed arrangement of, chlor of chlorophyll molecules until it gets to the bottom of it where this thing here is actually kind of like a diode, okay? It, it allows excitation energy to flow into the reaction center at the bottom, but not backwards, okay? It's a wire, a piece of one directional excitation energy wire that moves energy through these things. It actually is not made of one of these things, but rather three of these things in a, in a little molecular trimer, okay? Biomolecular trimer. And uh, to simulate something like that, 
There are, if you actually put bits and pieces around it, there are millions of atoms. Okay? So we have to start to think about doing electronic structure, doing di uh, vibrational motion of the, of the whole complex in, with, with a very large system. Okay? And that's actually what we do do. We make some approximations along the way, and that's what I'm going to share with you now, which we have focused on. Uh, okay. Uh, these natural systems move energy very quickly. You'll, this is, gives you some idea of the time scale here. Uh, that's looking at the one is one picosecond, one by 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Okay. Uh, and so uh, energy is moved from one. Uh, one and two actually uh, are beating with each other coherently and dumping population into state three, the blue state. Uh, and on the 10 picosecond time scale, you see uh, the system approach equilibrium. Okay, that's the, that's the, these little arrows here are actually the Boltzmann factors associated with each of those quantum mechanical states that tell you that the system has evolved to equilibrium. Uh, I'm going to show you now that in fact those little oscillatory things, those oscillations that are appearing in the simulation, are in fact observed in experiments. Okay, there are actual coherent behaviors that, that these guys exhibit. So that means it, it, it's, it's just like interference effects in your cell phone network. Uh, 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 you know, you've got a cell phone here, somebody else has got another one over there, you all start talking, there's all sorts of interference effects. That's what those things are, only they're quantum mechanical ones rather than electrodynamical ones, okay, in, in, these, in these energy transmission arrays. Uh, and so there's evidence of this quantum coherence in, uh, in uh, photosynthetic systems. And the question is, does nature actually exploit this? When this was first published about five years ago now, there was an enormous amount of uh, excitement in the community uh, of people who do quantum dynamics because this looked like, wow, nature may actually take advantage of this. I'm going to show you it doesn't, uh, which is kind of, a, kind of a downer for me, because, uh, uh, but we had to find out, okay, because it would have been great if nature actually used it, but maybe it does, but, but maybe we as, as uh, bio-inspired engineers and physicists and whatever can start to think about how we might take advantage of it, and I'll show you an example of that. Okay, uh, there, are, there are lots of things that can happen once these excitons start moving around. You have things known as uh, singlet, uh, singlet fission, uh, where you can create triplets. This is actually a very interesting process. We have only started to study it. So you've got one excitation, okay, that uh, is, a, is a singlet excitation. That singlet excitation can actually be transferred to two molecules in the form of triplets, triplet excitons, okay. And those triplet excitons can then dissociate, producing two electrons. So you can use one photon to get multiple electrons. If you did that, your efficiency would be double. Okay? That's the whole point, is to be able to take advantage of the, su of the subsequent decay processes that are in these materials in order to uh, make these materials more efficient. Nature doesn't do this. Okay? This would be something that an artificial material, like uh, a quantum dot array or something like this, could actually take advantage of multi-exciton generation. This is the charge separation process I mentioned earlier. Indeed, the electron and the hole move around as the exciton is, moved, is being transported. But when they get to places called reaction centers, the electron and hole split up and start to move in separate ways. And that's where we get our current from. You also have things that degrade the amount of current that you can get, such as charge recombination processes that take place in the future as well. Uh, and as I said, there are these very complex environments that are responsible for dissipating the energy in the system. You've got to be very careful. Nature, I'll show you that in fact, if you don't have dissipation, you don't get anything. You just get simple harmonic motion backwards and forwards. It doesn't go anywhere. You need a sink, a place where you can go. You need a way of getting rid of the energy so you go down the sink. Otherwise, you just get to the top. So the dissipation is critical. The dissipation causes decoherence of the quantum information. We'll talk about that in a second. But this environment and its function is really important. If you don't have something to dissipate the energy, you won't go downhill and you won't end up in state three as we had up there before. You'll actually just stay in state one and two. Um, so fluctua environmental fluctuations are important. Um, this is actually the material I mentioned before. I'll show you some examples of that. This is actually uh, a bio-inspired uh, 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 type of material. Uh, it's a polymer, uh, a, uh, a polymer that actually uh, can be photo excited and produce these excitons. Uh, and it's a little, uh, it's very cheap. You can uh, make it out of 
plastic bags and bottles. Uh, it's, uh, they're easy to make. Uh, and you just need uh, an interface with something like uh, a carbon nanotube. Okay, and this is actually an example of a material that, uh, that our collaborators in uh, Oxford are, are, are working on. Um, and the idea is to actually start to understand how to improve the efficiency by using the various different processes that are observed. This is the sort of thing we're talking about then. Uh, one of these uh, molecules in the polymer has been excited. Uh, this, uh, these excitons start to move around between those molecules using the processes I just described to you, downhill. Uh, it gets into the region, uh, this interfacial region, where the exciton states and the so-called charge transfer states become similar in energy, and charge transfer takes place, and you get electrons moving along the conductor and holes moving around in the hole conductor. The polymer actually is a good hole conductor. And so this is a, a piece of material that in principle can function like this. Okay. Now, uh, and give rise to, to current. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to stop on that one. Uh, here. Um, let me spend a few seconds now telling you about what I mean by uh, quantum coherence. Okay, This is an important phenomenon that uh, goes back to this uh, uh, rather ugly image that Schrodinger dreamed up to explain it to people. Uh, it's about killing cats or kittens, which is not very pleasant, but uh, it's about doing it quantum mechanically. Okay? And the whole idea, if, if you come up with this diabolical device, you have here a piece of very uh, nasty, green-looking radioactive material. Okay? And that radioactive material is fundamentally quantum. The nuclei either do or do not. Uh, they have two states. They either spit uh, alpha particles or beta particles out, or they don't. Okay, that's a and that decision is a quantum mechanical process as the as the particles tunnel out of the nucleus or whatever they do. Uh, if they radiate or if they if they uh, emit, they get picked up here. And uh, so what we've got is uh, is a uh, what we can do here is actually produce a superposition. Now let me talk about superpositions because this is what what uh, all of these ideas of coherence are about. So let's go to the very top. So there is an equation. This is about the most important equation, but it's not too difficult to understand. So let's spend a few seconds thinking about it. At the top there, you see I've got uh, a quantum system wave function. That's the psi 1 plus psi 2. That's the decayed and undecayed nuclei. Okay? Uh, and psi 1 and psi 2 are the, qu are the quantum states of this thing. The big Greek letter chi at the top there is the wave function for everything else, the poisonous gas uh, the, and the cat okay, out of the environment. Now, uh, initially, the system has been prepared in a separable state. That means there's a, there's a term here that has just got, the, got the, the quantum subsystem and a term that's got the uh, environment subsystem. And they're product together. That's as I run Schrodinger equation dynamics, this is the holy grail for moving quantum systems around. The full system is quantum, okay? I get what's called a, because uh, the environment feels different forces, different environmental behavior, depending on whether it's state one or state two. And so what will happen is state one will push the environment in a different way, giving rise to a different state. State two will push the environment in a different way, giving rise to a different state. So now I actually have this state here, which is called an entangled state, which is actually a linear combination of these two possible histories. Okay? And those two possible histories have chi 1, which would be a dead cat if, the, if this one was in state 1, and chi 2 being a live cat if this thing was in state 2. Okay? And so those two things actually coexist. And so that's the paradox that uh, underlies this notion of Schrodinger's cat, is the fact that you can act this thing, both alive and dead, at the same time. Okay? And indeed you can. That's the point. That's what happens when we make linear combinations of wave functions. Why don't we see cats alive and dead? Well, this is the whole point. Because the cat is a very big system, it's got a lot of quantum, uh, a lot of degrees of freedom. Okay. Let's follow through. This is the one piece of algebra that I'm going to actually insist that we follow through in detail. When I take 
a probability amplitude, such as that psi, and square it, that gives me a probability, right? If I've got two terms, I'm going to get three terms out the other side, right? I'm going to get the first term squared, psi 1 squared, chi 1 squared, and I'm going to integrate it out over all the environment and just focus on the quantum system. That's what those integral signs are about. So this is the problem. The, the psi 1 is the probability that cats are alive. Uh, and the uh, nuclear system has not decayed. Psi 2 is the probability that the cat is dead and that the nuclear system has decayed. Okay? And then I've got this other term that comes from multiplying two things together, the cross terms. Okay? And those cross terms have this structure. They in, indeed, this is the thing that tells us about the cat being alive and dead at the same time. Now, the important thing here is that, in fact, if I now focus on the question whether uh, the cat is alive or dead, whether the electron or the, the, the uh, alpha decay has occurred, uh, then I have to do the integrals over all of these environment degrees of freedom. I have to do all those integrals. And this thing here is actually an overlap. Okay? It's an overlap of one state with another state, a state of the environment, a many body state. Okay? Lots of particles contributing to this overlap. Think about this. Suppose this is, these are my, these are my initial environmental wave functions, they sit the same way. State one pushes the system in one way, and it moves this way. State two pushes the system, and it moves in a different way. Oh, great. State one and state two move the environment in different ways, and so you get these wave functions. And, and so what happens as time goes on, that initially perfectly overlapped term, right, the term that is actually responsible for this uh, cat being alive and being dead at the same time, uh, it actually, that overlap starts to vanish as these two wave functions no longer overlap. Okay, so that's how the coherence that we start out initially disappears. Okay, so that's, now, let's think about this overlap. Why is it important about, the point, about how many particles there are? Imagine this was a product of 10 to the 23 Gaussians, okay? And they started not overlapping by 0.1 or 0.001 or something like that. Okay. So they were still very, very close, but they weren't, they were they just moved away a little bit. Kind of like the way I've drawn this here, right? The red one is a little bit displaced. They're only a little bit displaced, it's 0.001. And I raise that to the 10 to the 23. You see what happens? As I if I take a just a small overlap and raise it to a very large number, it rapidly disappears. Okay. So that's why we don't see this in macroscopic systems, because we have lots of particles that are actually having this overlap vanish. Okay. Now, these systems don't have 10 to the 23. They have maybe several hundred thousand or several hundred million particles. This is actually uh, a, a, a surface, a piece of a, of a biological vesicle membrane okay, uh, for uh, uh, one of these bacterial uh, systems, and it has all sorts of remarkably intricate structures, which are actual chlorophyll molecules embedded in these protein environments. Okay, this is these are the chlorophyll molecules in these beautiful structures. Uh, these are chlorophyll molecules here that act as kind of focusing mirrors to focus energy into these uh, other little structures, the blue things, which are reaction centers, okay? where energy is transformed from excitation moving around into charge separation. Okay? Uh, now, this is a lot of particles. But nevertheless, experiments show us that this thing, those alive and dead states, that quantum coherent behavior, actually persists in this thing for picoseconds. Right? That's, that's something we can actually measure. So even though there's lots of degrees of freedom, this because of the things move in very collective ways in these materials, because they're polymers, you actually get long-lived coherent behavior. Long-lived is 10 to, the 10, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Okay, so it's, it's not long-lived on biological time scales, but it's very long-lived on the types of time scales that people can probe things these days with lasers. Okay, so you can actually see it, and I'll show you in a second. Now, one of the things that's important here is, uh, and this is why um, I, I sort of put this uh, slide together, this is actually uh, our, our current state of the art Disensitized solar cell type material. Okay, it's a titanium uh, dioxide, an anatase crystal structure of of, uh, of TiO2. Uh, this is uh, black sand off the beach, right? That has been um, uh, 
uh, sensitized by putting a dye molecule on top. Okay, what happens in our uh, dye-sensitized solar cells, indeed, is that, that that dye molecule gets excited. It's a dye. It's the color of a luscious shirt. Uh, and and it, it absorbs light, and, in, and that uh, ex excited molecule then injects electrons into this material, which is a semiconductor, and you put a field across it, and you drag the electrons around, and, and you get a current out of it. You've got to do some other things at the top here, but that's, that's basically the story. These things do the same thing here. So this molecule, the reaction center, actually does the same thing. Okay? You actually, but there's all sorts of really wonderful stuff here. There's lots of places where photons can get absorbed and moved around. Our materials don't do this. Okay? Disensitized solar cells don't have harvesting networks. So this is one of the next, the next generation solar cells are actually going to take, and I'll show you some examples of these later, take advantage of, the, of what nature does. Okay? It moves things around in exciton networks. I showed you an example of like this of the, of the polymer with the uh, carbon nanotube in it. Okay, so these are the sorts of systems we want to simulate, want to be able to understand. That's actually a simulation showing you a real life quantum mechanical simulation with uh, 30 chromophores uh, embedded in a, in a protein. And this is what you're actually looking at is the quantum dynamics of the populations of the excitation in these different chromophores using these quantum mechanical, dissipative quantum mechanical dynamics methods. And one of the things you actually see here, and I'll show you, uh, uh, so basically I take this simulation and I now look at the actual populations. These are the populations of the different states. And one of the things you actually see is pairs of states going up and down. There's a guy, bunch of guys going up and down. That's coherent oscillation. That's quantum mechanical coherent behavior. And uh, the blue and the purple curve going down and up. Okay, there it is back there. So in fact, what's happening there is you've got energy transferring backwards and forwards between pairs of soft chromophores in the system. Okay, that's exactly the sort of thing. So in other words, it's coherent behavior that is, is, is persisting on the one to two picosecond time, time scale uh, in that system. This is the friend we were talking about earlier. This is the phantom matthews olsen complex, uh, this uh, uh, exciton conduit. This is what it's starting to look like. I'm peeling away the material around the outside. There are, uh, there are uh, anti-parallel beta sheets and, uh, and uh, alpha helical pieces to the protein. So there are different types of protein environment. Different types of protein environment have different types of dissipative characteristics. They dissipate energy away from the, from the excitation uh, in different ways. We'll see examples of how that works later. Uh, and there are our friends with chromophores buried inside this thing. Now, these are two, these are two chlorophyll molecules that are separated by about 30 angstroms in this system. Okay? And in fact, you can go in, and this is what was done in these beautiful experiments from about five years ago, you can photoexcite both these together and produce uh, a coherent superposition of them and watch it move around in, uh, in real time. And that's what these very colorful pictures are actually telling you about. These, uh, this is a, a two-dimensional nonlinear spectrum of uh, the absorption of, this is the linear absorption spectrum of this molecule. There's, there are a bunch of bumps associated with this molecule absorbing, or that molecule absorbing, or that molecule absorbing. They absorb at different frequencies, different wavelengths, because they have different environments. Each one of the chromophores have different environments. Um, and uh, what if, so if you look along the diagonal of this, that's what you see. If you actually start time, this is zero time, this is 155 femtoseconds, 300 femtoseconds, 600 femtoseconds, you see peaks off diagonal in this uh, spectrum. And those are peaks that are actually proportional or related to the intensity of the, the amplitude of the coherent superposition. So in fact, the coherent superposition is becoming a large component of this, of this evolving wave function as time goes on. We photo excited this, and we get energy uh, separating and uh, energy moving through the system in a coherent way. Um, in fact, this is looking at the coherent being. This is actually uh, at, as a function of temperature. This is uh, 77K. You actually see this beautiful beating pattern. There it is up there, uh, taking off the, 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 the K signal. Even uh, these experiments were done in Chicago, 277 degrees Kelvin is room temperature in Chicago. And so that's uh, it's pretty cold in Chicago. Uh, so in fact, you see little bumps throughout the, uh, throughout the thing, even at, at, at room temperature. So that, that prompted this question is, does nature use? this coherent behavior, because it, it persists at high temperature. Um, 
Uh, you see it all over the place. This is a uh, this is a core, this is the reaction center molecule, and indeed the experiments on the reaction center molecule. Uh, these are the nonlinear optical spectrum. We put in lots of different pulses, and you look at uh, the intensity outside. They show not only electronic coherent behavior, that's the little red patches, but they also show modulation. In other words, the protein is breathing. The protein is doing oscillatory behavior. That's actually modulating the coupling between these quantum states. Uh, this, is an, this is the molecule I, I mentioned briefly before. This is actually a molecule out of an algae. Uh, this is the same sort of signals. Trust, uh, 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 you have to trust the experiment force. They, they, they see these things, they draw these up weird lines, and, and they say, that's quantum coherence. And, and I, I believe them. And, and, uh, and, and again, it lives for many hundreds of, uh, of femtoseconds. This is an intriguing structure. I'll show you a little bit more about it later. This is a structure. Notice these things are no longer those beautiful rings. This is now a uh, what's called a bilin molecule. And a bilin molecule is like a chlorophyll molecule in SNPs. So chlorophyll molecules do what we call intercalate into proteins. They just, just sit there inside us. They don't actually bind to the outside. These molecules, these bilins, okay, actually covalently bind to the protein around them. Right? So the actual way in which these molecules dissipate their energy is fundamentally different because it's actually connected. It's mechanically connected to the surroundings. So there are different different types of, of dissipative behavior that take place. Uh, even technological materials show this same sort of behavior. This is actually uh, an organic light emitting diode material, a uh, polymer that's used in OLEDs. And again, you see characteristic signatures of long-lived coherent vibrational motions. Whenever you've got a polymer that's embedded with things that you can excite, those things that you can excite evolve quantum mechanically, coherently. Um, this is an equation. I wasn't supposed to put in more of them up, okay? But this one here actually tells you about the model that we use to describe these types of systems. Okay? Uh, it's got uh, energies uh, associated with the individual sites, okay? It's got couplings that tell us how strongly these different molecules are coupled to each other. They've got little transition dipoles here, and transition dipoles over there that actually interact with each other. And that tells us how quickly the energy transfers from one to the other. So those couplings do this. Um, that's all the quantum system. That's these guys here. The models we use actually have uh, this as their environment. Okay, This should be a very familiar looking environment to us all. Uh, anybody who's done uh, high school uh, uh, mathematics knows that that's a bunch of strings. Okay? That's a parabola. Okay, And this is the momentum. So this is a, a harmonic oscillator bar. Okay? And that's basically what we use here. So the big R variables are all the protein. And the little Cs tell us about how the protein and the environment are to each other. And that's it. Okay? So it's a very simple model of side energies, couplings between the sites, and uh, terms that tell us how the system couples to the environment, okay? the, the uh, bar environment. Uh, and the way that the, 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 this uh, this, this, the, the strength of these couplings between the environment and the, and the quantum system, these Cs, are actually determined by this beautiful object here. I'll show you pictures of this. This is called the spectral density. And it's a thing that tells us about how, if I've got a, 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 an environment out in, the, uh, a mode out in the environment that has some frequency of oscillation, how strongly does it couple, okay? Does it, 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 does it couple very strongly to dissipate energy from the system or weakly to dissipate energy from the system? So the spectral density is the key thing that tells us about the way the environment and the quantum system interact with each other. Can you tell me how long I've been talking? Okay. So now, to make a long story short, you can go away and do things called perturbation theory. Okay? Perturbation theory starts to make approximations about the magnitudes of these things. And there's all sorts of great theories, fret theory, uh, red field theory. Uh, the big problem, however, is that in these photosynthetic systems, perturbation theory doesn't make sense. Okay? You need to worry about the fact that all these things are about the same magnitude. So, in the next 30 slides, there's a methodology. Uh, and this methodology actually enables you to do that stuff. Uh, it's a little more than 30, actually, but it's really good. Uh, to do that stuff in, in a semi-classical way. So we treat the environment semi-classical. 
almost classically, not completely, we put some quantum effects in it, but we treat the quantum system quantum mechanically. We actually put the, well, the whole thing in there. Okay. Um, there are more examples, oh gosh, that was what I was telling you about just before the end. Okay. <laughs> okay, now let's take a look at some of these systems using that type of methodology. Okay. So how do we actually describe these systems? So this is this is actually showing you, showing you uh, uh, the uh, uh, a close up of that uh, of that complex that acts as a wire. Uh, there's the chlorosome. There's a thing called the base plate that holds all these things together. Uh, and this is a um, a very pretty system that has been studied a lot experimentally. Okay. Now I'm going to preface this by saying when they study it experimentally, it's very difficult to do it in vivo. For the physicist, that means in the cell. Okay? Biologists, you know what that means. Uh, to do it in vivo, you need to have all the bits and pieces around, you wouldn't know what you want to think. Okay? So what they do is they take this system and they put it in water. Okay? That means they take the top off and they take the bottom off and they put it in water. Okay? And when they do that, what actually happens, as you'll see in a minute, is that chromophore number eight, which is actually held in by the bottom by this base plate, drifts off into solution. Okay. So they're studying something that's not really the real system in the biological membrane. Okay. Uh, and so this is actually, we do simulations that look like this. Okay. We, we actually put it in a membrane, put stuff on top of it, and study this, this kind of basic system. Uh, we need to build models for this. So we actually calculate parameters for all these sorts of things. Okay. And uh, this is the experiment. As I said, this is the experiment done only with seven chromophores, okay, because the one from the slide blown off. And you see this coherent behavior. Here's what actually happens when you do this calculation, do this study. This is what I was telling you about earlier. Um, this is actually looking at uh, photo exciting chromophore number one, which is what they do in the experiment. Okay, you know what the wavelength that it's all happening, it's photo exciting. And what you see happening when I've got uh, solid lines, the, the, or the lines here that uh, oscillate up and down strongly, like this, are uh, when I have uh, no dissipation. Okay, so I don't have a bath that can absorb the energy. And all that happens is the energy just goes back and forward between one and two. One and two, one and two, it just oscillates like this. Okay, and number three, with no dissipation, just stays small. Okay, so in other words, if I have no dissipation, if I have no protein around me, I never get energy into the number three, and number three is actually at the bottom here, which delivers the energy to the reaction center. Okay. If I turn the dissipation on, I see that the amplitude of those Rabi oscillations decays. That's decoherent behavior. Okay. And I see, moreover, that the two initially excited and prepared states dis uh, decay, and that state number three grows in. So I get my energy transfer. So I have to have this dissipation if photosynthesis or any of these types of transfer processes work. This actually shows you some of the energetics of these molecules. Uh, uh, there are in fact not only not one, but so I, I just cut that off because I was doing the experiment. This is where number eight actually is in the energy scheme of things. We have to do calculations to get this stuff. We were doing exciting this, following this channel down here. This is actually another channel through the, pro through the protein that actually involves uh, pairs of coherent diamonds, coherent coupled couple diamonds that can transfer energy too. Okay? And this is actually showing you a very pretty experiment where we can actually look at the beating, there it goes, the transfer of population and thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium, this is just to show you that this methodology that we have that's very powerful that can describe these open quantum systems does what it's supposed to do. Many approximate methods, the ones I told you about before, perturbation theory, don't do this. Okay. The key is that if I prepare a system in a different state, okay, what happens at long times? It goes to thermal equilibrium. It doesn't care about the preparation. And indeed, when I take my method and I prepare it in state number six, and I see that state number six and state number five oscillate with each other, beat, and they start feeding population to state number seven and state number four, they start doing some very interesting coherent beating and and population transfer, but at long times, we get Mr. Boltzmann back. He shouldn't have cut off his ear after all. Uh, so, so uh, 
you have a, a methodology that can describe these dissipative open forms very reliably uh, in, these, in these types of methods. And you can use it to look at all sorts of great things. Uh, this is actually a calculation using that, that model to be parameterized by doing all sorts of electronic structure calculations and systems, comparing with the experiments. You see, it does a very, very nice job of, of tracking the, the dissipation and decay. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a molecular model of that system, the base plate and all this sort of stuff. That thing sits on top and holds all these chromophores together. And so in fact, chromophore number eight is really supposed to be there okay, in the real system. Okay? So this gets to this question of, yes, experimentalists see pairs of coherently coupled diamonds beating with each other. Okay? Great. Does nature do anything with it? Well, let's look in vivo. Right? That's where you should be looking. Right? So let's put the chromophore number eight back in. Okay? Chromophore 8 is actually uh, on the way from the base plate down into this wire. Okay, it's a little connector. It's like a little uh, alligator clip you know, that connects the uh, base plate of the harvesting network to the, the piece of wire. There it is, right there. Let's put it in place and let's excite it. Okay, because that's really what we're supposed to be exciting. The laser in the experiments excited number one because they didn't have number eight and they 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 choose number one, right? So in the real in vivo, eight is there, and it's the guy that you should excite first. And so let's do that. This just shows you what these things look like up close and personal. There's number eight there. It's in this little premise, uh, and uh, it transfers to number one in the next one. That's basically what, what it does. Uh, and so if I actually excite number one, this is now at 300 k or uh, 200. You see the coherent beating. You see the decay, and just what they saw in the experiment. If you excite number eight, it just decays. The other two states just grow. Because there's a time scale here, okay? I haven't perturbed the system initially at zero time. In nature, I don't perturb the system initially at zero time by producing state one or state two independently. Rather, what I do is the, the photons get down, or the excitation gets down to eight, and then it slowly fills up one and two equally, okay? So in fact, yeah, it, it, this happens in the artificial laser excited system that uh, is studied in these, uh, in these things. You see this nice coherent beating. But in the real, in, in vivo, it's not set up that way. Okay? It's not set up to actually be coherent. So that's a, a big statement. Um, seeing we're running out of time, I'm not going to tell you too much about all these other things here. Um, other than to say, uh, so you can now, what we can now do is actually go in to these very complex systems and start to look at the environment around each one of these molecules and probe it in detail with our calculations. Okay? And we can tell you that different environments have different dissipative natures. Okay? They have different response. They have different spectral densities. And so that's actually what was in this uh, slide over here. This is actually showing you that, in fact, some chromophores don't, this is the experimentally fit spectral density. They're all assumed to be the same in many calculations. And in fact, when we go up and we calculate the real spectral density, they're all fundamentally different. And they're different in really interesting ways. Number two is actually got a high frequency, this green peak is very different from this. And there's a very good reason for that. And that's because the protein, this is actually showing you what's going on here. The protein, this is actually looking at the guys that are closest to it. The protein leaks. Proteins do this. You've got these antennae sitting in here that are supposed to be transmitting the energy, but the protein is flappy, it's, uh, and the solvent molecules can get in. And in fact, molecule no, uh, this number two, this green molecule here, actually has water molecules now. So solvent molecules actually come in and, and change the spectral density, change its response characteristics. And uh, indeed, that's what you're seeing here. That's this, this little flap of beta sheet opens up, water molecules come in, and give rise to a fundamentally different type of spectral density. Okay. And uh, so what you can imagine doing is actually thinking about this. And we can go in and probe the dynamics. This is actually looking at the, the, the dynamics of these different things. You can, in the case where uh, you have uh, a, uh, a weak coupling, so if I take number two and make it into number one, I see lots of coherent behavior. Okay. Uh, and if I, if I turn it back off again, uh, I, I see the coherence get removed. Okay? So you can imagine, and in fact that's what this experiment does, it's a computational experiment, where I mutated. I went in and I mutated the environment 
by changing the spectral width. And so I can actually tune the response of this system, the way it actually transfers energy to be more coherent or less coherent depending on what type of uh, environment. So this is starting to actually be able to address the question, can I tell an experimentalist, what uh, a biologist in this case, what he should do as far as mutating the, the environment in such a way as to optimize the energy throughput or change things to in, in ways where he might, if he wants to highlight this coherent behavior, uh, be able to do things like that. Um, there's another, I mentioned one other system. I'm going to finish short, trust me. Um, I mentioned this other system uh, for a very good reason, and this is because um, quantum physicists love the fact that people are starting to think about quantum computation all these wonderful things that can go on in quantum computers, in quantum land. Right? Um, when I first saw this, uh, this is actually the energy level diagram for this uh, particular, this is algae, okay? This is a piece of algae, right? Uh, there are these various different chromophores that are buried in this uh, alpha helical protein uh, and covalently attached to it, okay? Uh, and there are some interesting structures. There's a, a pair of states over here, Okay, that's those two states there, that one there, and that one there. Those and they're coupled. There's the pair of states over here, that's uh, the, this one here, and that one there, and they're coupled, that's the dotted blue line there. Uh, and then there are strongly coupled pairs, the red lines here, okay, uh, that uh, are um, in between, okay? Now, one of the things that that sort of strikes in your heart, okay, so this is actually exploring all sorts of things here, but sorry, I'm going to this is in fact, there's a, a beautiful uh, theory that was uh, put together by people at Bell Labs uh, in, the, in, the, in, the late, in the early 90s, uh, understanding how you could, if you produced, uh, if Alice produced a, a coherent superposition of two quantum subsets, quantum states that she had hold off, okay? And uh, Bob had his own quantum subsystem out there, okay, that had two states. Could I exactly replicate the quantum mechanical phase information that Alice has at a distance by transmitting in, uh, appropriate information? You can, okay? Uh, and if you have quantum mechanical channels that preserve coherent information, and we do, right? There are these biological molecules that actually do this. So you could imagine teleporting the phase information that Alice has along one of the quantum, one of the quantum communication channels to Bob, okay, and actually doing this. Now we do this, this has already been done in this beautiful experiment that was reported a couple of weeks ago, where in fact they had uh, a coherent superposition of photons on uh, uh, Tenerife and another coherent superposition of phonons on uh, La Palma in the Canary Islands. 89 miles apart, and they allow these things to entangle or to talk to one another through uh, a laser beam that's shown between the two of them, a quantum mechanical channel. And you could have, you could actually, and they demonstrated this, uh, it's been demonstrated many times in many different ways, quantum teleportation of the exact information that somebody has about the phase of his wave function to somebody else. Okay? Uh, well, uh, you need to do it here, okay? It's much shorter, okay? It's uh, a few uh, nanometers, but it's molecules that could in principle be excited in this way and transfer their quantum information from one place to another place. Exactly. That's wishful thinking. I haven't done that. Uh, I need to put in two photons, in, uh, two exotons into the system to allow this to happen. Actually, three. Uh, she needs one. Uh, there needs to be one here, and there needs to be one over here. Um, but I would love uh, a non linear optical spectroscopy to try and do something like this. So if there's me in the house and I know there are, um, give it a shot. Okay, I should finish. There's a lot of nice other stuff in here, but uh, uh, I didn't talk anything about the charge transfer. We've simulated that as well. Uh, this is actually uh, a network of uh, a harvesting networks. There's a reaction center, and this is the complicated energy diagram we have to calculate. There are different types of uh, uh, spectral densities depending on whether it's an exciton or a charge transfer state. Uh, and, but you can do it and, and you can get some very complex uh, dynamics of, of very large uh, quantum systems. 
uh, exploring not only the exciton motion, but also the charge separation process like the cartoon I showed you earlier. This is actually our first attempt at doing this for uh, Laura Hertz's system, uh, where we're actually photo exciting a molecule out here in the protein, uh, in, the, in, in this thing, and then watching the uh, charge separation take place. I did the power example too. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, quantum uh, calculations that you have to do with various different high level methods to, to actually parameterize those models. Um, there's lots of technological applications for this, and I'll finish on this. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a really very um, interesting idea. Uh, here is, for example, uh, uh, disensitized TiO2 columns. Okay, these are nano, nano structured columns. Uh, and if you put, uh, if you shine light on it, the dye absorbs, it injects the electrons, and then it goes. Uh, what a group uh, last year uh, did, uh, actually a couple of years ago now, is they actually uh, used uh, electrospray methods to blow uh, chlorosomes onto the surface of these things. Okay? So the chlorosomes are the hardest thing, they're natural. So this is a, a, a bio-composite, a bio-artificial composite. And in fact, in, in this particular case, you could increase the photocurrent of this device using the fact that I'm now uh, taking all my photons and, tr and transferring them to uh, excitation of electrons and holes uh, in, the, in this thing, you can increase the photo by a factor of 30 by doing something like this. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, potential. Um, there are lots of other um, systems that people are working on, uh, looking at using quantum dots, for example, uh, on, uh, as, as chromophores, well, almost like, uh, so these guys absorb uh, light, they have, because they're quantum dots, they have a very broad range of uh, absorption frequencies, absorption spectrum, uh, and, uh, and, and then they transfer energy, their excitation energy to the dye, the dye injects the electron, and uh, the, there's an electrolyte out here to replenish these things. So there's a lot, to, uh, and this is starting to look more and more like harvesting and, and, and charge transfer types of systems that people are starting to uh, build and construct. Okay, uh, I should finish there. Uh, I hope I've uh, excited you about exciting molecules uh, and uh, and getting them to do work for us and uh, create energy. Uh, and uh, I, I hope I've also convinced you that quantum effects do play a role in some of these things, but it's not clear to me that nature actually, you, we don't have evidence that nature actually uses these things because our experiments are Thank you. So what we did was, in fact, to 
uh, you know, it's a it's a calculation. I can I can mutate the protein. I can do what uh, in, in my head or on the computer, right? And I can turn off the low frequency peak and or and leave it on. Okay, so I can actually go in and do this. And if you turn it off, what you find is the uh, the um, so this is looking at the off diagonal to the density matrix. They decay very quickly. Okay? They decay twice as fast as with the on. So in other words, the low frequency modes are responsible for the long-lived uh, coherent behavior. Now if I look at the actual population, okay, the rate of energy transfer uh, when I do this and depend on to this, what do I see? This is when I turn it off. Okay? The terminal states go up twice as fast. So in other words, if you spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards and not getting to the end state, not a big surprise, you have a much slower energy transfer rate. So the coherence hurts the efficiency of energy transfer in the system. Exactly. Uh, other questions? Yes? Uh, I have a question about the uh, Uh, we haven't done it, but it's it's 
uh, there are uh, several papers, um, Ronnie Kosloff in, uh, in um, uh, Tel Aviv, our uh, office done exactly this. There are, uh, not in a, in, a, in a realistic model, but uh, studying the properties of uh, Fermi uh, bars, that is, uh, or spin bars, like this. There's a lot of work this. Um, uh, let me be clear, our methodology, we, we, do, we use this model because it's a popular model. We don't rely on any aspect of this model. So we could simply take our, our algorithms that we develop and apply it to any type of model. In fact, we can even apply it to a molecular detail model. That's what we're working with. We can actually do a uh, little show in the Okay, let's thank Professor Cooper for the